welcome everyone to Thailand's Food Innovation. Uh, this one is a webinar series of the Thailand Chamber of Commerce, and uh, we stress on the fact that uh, uh, by saying uh, Thailand Food Innovation, we mean a uh, new focus on trends, sustainability, nutrition, and taste, as uh, suggested uh, by, by Massimo uh, when we were uh, thinking about uh, this topic. So I would like to thank you, Massimo. Uh, to begin, maybe uh, if you can have a look at this presentation, we give you a bit of uh, uh, an about. Uh, so, uh, without further uh, talking, I would like to uh, say who are the speakers and uh, which is the calendar. Of course, we start with Massimo, which is the guest of today, and also uh, the first presenter that we start uh, these sessions of uh, episodes that uh, we're going to uh, to have uh, every Friday uh, and um, uh, the second episode will be uh, with Mr. Chef Eduardo Benavolta from Bear Food uh, talking about uh, uh, the use of nuts uh, to make cheese. Uh, we will have also Kun Narut from Shabar talking about the cacao revolution in Thailand if uh, we can stay like this. And uh, we will have episode four with Rosalind from Arcadian Fine Food. She's here today also, uh, talking about uh, restoring our harmony with nature to food stories and experience. She's also a writer for um, uh, Banco 101. Uh, the, last one, the last episode for the moment that we published today is uh, with uh, uh, Kun Ploy Chano from uh, Tom Cassava talking about uh, uh, clean tech innovation from agri waste uh, to uh, wellness and wealth. Uh, okay, I think that uh, regarding the introduction, uh, Massimo, uh, I stop uh, sharing my, my presentation from my side is all. Uh, Massimo, as I mentioned before, is the founder of um, uh, uh, Baxolutli, and you have also another brand which is Bella Pupa. And Massimo is one of the, uh, I would say, uh, one of the main experts about this, uh, this innovative field, the Massimo. So please, I leave it to you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I leave Massimo speaking now. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I'm an expert, but uh, I started pretty early um, following this new trend of eating insect. Um, as, as for many of the other startups uh, that opened up in the last seven to eight years, um, making food with insects, um, I, as for the other, for me, it was the same. I, I found this, um, this idea of eating bugs uh, just making so much sense for the reason that I'm going to explain to you. Uh, within the help of a few slides. Um, I'll try not to, to focus all the presentation on the slides and maybe um, finding the time to, to get questions from you and, um, and make this a conversation. Um, but um, let's start to give this a, a little of context because uh, many people have heard um, now there are some packaged products containing insects, um, but clearly most of the people don't know about insect farming or why we use crickets in most of the products um, or why this is a little expensive, at least for now. Um, so let's start from a, maybe from a video um, that gives you the idea of the reaction of Western people uh, when when we process insects into powder and we use them as an ingredient instead of eating them uh, as a whole. And for doing this, I will share my presentation. Let's see, it should be. Is it shared like this? No, I don't see the sh Not yet, right? No, no, I cannot see it, uh, Massimo. Maybe 
let me go for the share screen button and should be this okay. yes now we can see and there we go so i launched this one it's one minute video this this was a radio radio broadcasting in the u.s and i didn't know they they bought the cricket pasta which is what i do here in thailand from our website so we didn't pay for this we just find out it was it was was done by this uh, national radio um, program in, in the u.s So the, um, I, I like this video for, for a number of reasons. Um, and the, f the most important one is that brings back the conversation to what food is about, so about the taste. Uh, and also it, it shows how the preconception about eating insects um, doesn't completely disappear, but it's, it's reduced to, to a very little thing when, when we don't eat the whole insects, but we use insect as an ingredient for, for food that we already know. So you, you are, I, I assume most of you know Thailand pretty well. So you, you are used to the idea of eating insects a little more than average Western people for the simple reason that you have seen a cart uh, with insects as a street food. Um, for, for a number of times of your life. Um, and actually, I believe that, that getting a, uh, yeah, um, used to the idea is, is, is very important because the entire preconception about edible insects uh, is, is not based on any fact. I mean, there is no reason why um, uh, crickets should look more uh, horrible uh, or dirty than a shrimp or, or many other things we already we already eat. So basically, it is it is a food habit. Some people never thought you may have a, a insect in the menu. The same way, like many Western foods are not in, in, eaten in Asia, uh, and some of them may generate some dist distaste or disgust because we, 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 we never thought you just can eat that. Uh, but this, this taste can also disappear pretty quickly. Uh, even my personal experience, you, you, the first time looks like something weird to do. Um, the majority of the people that never had the insect before has the same reaction. They, they, they are surprised that it doesn't taste horrible, uh, which, which say a lot about the preconception. Uh, we've, because we think insects are not to be eaten, um, we also think that they will taste bad. There is, there is a kind of uh, association that we make uh, between something that we think you shouldn't eat and, and the fact that it will taste bad. And then when most of the people find out that the insects actually eat pretty well, uh, taste pretty well, um, and if they keep on trying two or three times, they will forget that, the, that they had a problem with eating insects at the beginning. Um, so you may also have heard that insects have been eaten, someone says, by two mil million people around the world, 
on a kind of a regular basis. Um, and this is, this is true, but what's happening um, with edible insect and packaged food is something new. So for centuries, um, maybe a, a good part of the regions of the world have seen humans eating insects, but uh, mostly as, a, as something that was collected from the wild, it was not farmed. Um, also, not with sophisticated recipe, they were just eaten the whole insect and still do. That. If you go to a Yunnan restaurant in China, uh, or, or you look at the insects in Thailand, or, or you go to Mexico and you will find out many people eat the chapulines, which are kind of a cricket. Um, you, don't, you don't find the same complexity in, in, the, in the recipes and what can be done in, in a kitchen to cook an ingredient in, in, a, in a proper food. Um, so somehow this insect eating um, has been going on for centuries without really developing in packaged food or recipes that you, you find made from a chef with some creativity. It's always been kind of a street food thing, uh, very, very basic. But a few years ago, I would say less than 10 years ago, um, some startups uh, decided to, to package insects. At the beginning, like a gimmick um, or, a, or a whole whole food that some people want to try maybe out of an extreme experience. Uh, until some other startups decided that maybe the, the way to approach the market with this novel food is, is to start from the fitness. Uh, they thought you cannot go mainstream from the very beginning. You have to start from a niche and, uh, and uh, fitness people want protein and, and insects contains a lot of protein. So a lot of energy bars uh, has been developed in the last five years in this small, very small market. Uh, one of these, which is in my slide two, uh, the, the, the one with the blue color, black and blue, named ProPro, is also a, a Thai product, uh, which is one of the few I know in Thailand where insects has been processed into powder and then added as an ingredient. And it's made in Chiang Mai from an uh, American, uh, American Japanese uh, expat. Um, and it's, it's a really good product. A couple of the others, like Chapul, um, is, is, uh, is American, and you also have EXO, um, the red product um, that uh, is even more famous in the US between our small world of startups. And Genius is made in France, is probably the, the biggest bug startup in France. Um, but I have to say, I have more, I find more interesting when insects are used to make normal food like crackers uh, or chips uh, or burgers uh, because I'm not so sure um, insects should be just considered a, a protein source. I think there is much more than that. I think the taste is good enough to use it as an ingredient. I think minerals and vitamins uh, may make it make, make most of the bugs uh, like a superfood and not just a, a, a protein source. Um, cricket pasta is, is following this idea to, to transform insects, cricket in this case, into a powder um, and then use the powder as, as an ingredient of a food that is very common everywhere. Um, at the moment, the target for the uh, pasta made by Baxalutli is the European Union mostly, uh, possibly also the US. And as we will see uh, in a few minutes, uh, one of the problem with the European Union is that technically uh, insects as, as have not been approved as a legal food yet. So there is some flexibility in some, in some countries like the Netherlands or Denmark, uh, but 
exporting from Thailand to, to the EU in success food now would be very complicated because we expect the European Union to make the official uh, approval uh, of crickets by the end of this year. Um, there, is a, there are a lot of expectation uh, with uh, insects as a new um, food. Um, this is uh, something I'm not so sure of, meaning that I believe it's a good idea and, and there is a, a, a very interesting market potential. Uh, but I don't believe at the moment that this um, market survey has been done properly uh, because most of the insects that, have, that are eaten at the moment in the world uh, goes untracked. I mean, there is no invoice, it's more like a street food, um, it's an informal economy. Um, so I don't know where, where these projections are, 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 what they are based on. Um, so it's possible that, that, that there are really very good numbers in, in ahead of us, um, but I'm not sure these researches are, are really truthful. Um, most of the startups making these new products, uh, they usually don't want to tell how much, how many products they sell per month. Um, maybe they don't want to disappoint their investors. Uh, maybe they also go through an informal economy, they sell a lot online and not through physical retailers. So it's very hard to quantify how big the market it is now and how big it will be in a few years. Um, luckily, even if, 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 if it's not 100% legal to sell insects in Europe, the European Union, uh, some supermarkets are already uh, testing it. Um, in Germany, for example, I've heard uh, with very good results. Uh, Switzerland is not European Union, so they have their own regulation and they have a startup selling meatballs in supermarkets. And Sainsbury, I personally was in London a few months ago and bought um, these whole crickets, by the way, it's, it's not a package of uh, processed food, but just um, dry crickets, is in not all Sainsbury markets, but some of them at one pound, which is pretty expensive for 12 grams, but it's a good start. So I'm, I'm happy to see more products like this um, in, in Europe. Um, why are we talking about crickets and not other insects? Actually, uh, China has been farming um, silkworm uh, because of the silk um, for 4,000 years. Um, so they definitely know something about uh, how to farm a, an insect. And they also have 500,000 tons of silkworm a pupa. Uh, pupa is not the last stage of, of the uh, silkworm development. It goes from a caterpillar um, to a pupa and then to a moth. Um, but the one we usually are, we are used to see in, inside the cocoon is the pupa. And, and and these 500,000 tons that China produces every year are used sometimes as feed for animals or fertilizer for the soil, but, but really it's, it's also superfood that is not used. But aside from the Chinese experience and the strange case of Thailand, where for some reason a number of Thai farmers decided to, to farm cricket, insects in general are, are, have not been farmed. So we don't even know what we should give them as feed, um, how we can accelerate their growth, how we can reduce their diseases. This is all kind of new from the very beginning. Um, let's say a lot of startups in US and Europe uh, at the beginning used to think that crickets are easier. Um, it's, they, they may have a, a higher consumer acceptance uh, because the alternative, which would be probably walls, and, and a lot of people think that it's, it's too hard to convince the consumers to eat uh, walls, uh, which would be a kind of easier to farm, um, have a better conversion rate, uh, less uh, death rate in the first week, um, and this is also the reason why in, in Europe, actually now, they started farming not just crickets, but also mealworms. 
So we, we don't know uh, if crickets will be the mainstream cricket when, we, this will, when insects will be eaten more widely. Um, in the US, they definitely think so. Uh, so they don't use any mealworm that I know of for the new products. While in Europe, um, new, new products uh, coming from, uh, from startups um, are uh, sometimes crickets, but sometimes mealworms. Um, so cricket, the, the Thai cricket as a business might be in danger for a number of reasons, one of, of which is that mealworm might be a, an alternative to crickets, and we don't know if crickets will be successful in becoming the, the gateway bug. Um, at the moment, uh, the, they say the Ministry of Agriculture doesn't have an exact figure in my mind because uh, many of these farmers, uh, cricket farmers in Thailand, uh, they farm crickets as a hobby in the backyard. Um, so no one is sure how many they are, but it, it's said that they might be 20,000. Um, in mostly focused in the north, and northeast regions of Thailand, and very few in the in the south. Um, the price, wholesale price, is averagely between a minimum of 80 baht per kilo to 120 baht per kilo. Uh, maybe when it's a small market and it's and it's sold not wholesale but to consumers, might be maybe 150 baht per kilo. Um, now. Some companies in Thailand decided to buy these, these crickets, fresh crickets, and transform them into cricket powder, um, and then sell this cricket flour to the Western startup, uh, making uh, the products you have seen uh, in the slide before, like for example, these are Italian crackers. Um, this is a Canadian uh, uh, tomato sauce with crickets. Um, and, uh, and the price in Thailand at the moment for cricket flour is around, uh, start from 500 baht, but someone is even selling a uh, cricket flour at 1000 baht per kilo. Now to make one kilo of powder, you, which is just dry, dry cricket, you need four kilo of fresh crickets. So let's say the ingredient would be in Thailand 400 baht per kilo. Um, and then you add the, the electricity and the, the cost of the machinery to dry and grind the crickets and you easily get to a minimum of, let's say, 500 baht per kilo. Um, in Europe, for some reason, the price is a lot higher. Um, I would say not less than $60 per kilo. Uh, and in some cases, I heard $100 per kilo. Um, and this because Thai, Thai cricket farming has been going on for, for 50 years. Um, and, and somehow um, the model has been a little optimized. While uh, these new farms in the US and in Europe, um, they clearly started from the scratch uh, and trying to make a different farming model um, that is less based on labor. Uh, is less labor intensive and, and it's more um, uh, fo focused on uh, factory farming the same way we do with chicken. So um, large size, uh, uh, automatized processes somehow. So this, the model that will be the more efficient, the, the, the Asian model of the small farmer with low cost of labor and the, and the factory farming in Europe or US uh, I, it would be very hard now to say who, who will be more efficient and price-wise competitive. At the moment, the price in Thailand for crickets uh, is definitely lower than in the US and in Europe. Um, now, pre pretty quickly, because I think you know most of these things, um, we said crickets are a superfood. Uh, worms, too. I would say crickets have less fat than other uh, insects. Uh, but aside from that, uh, most of the insects I've, I've seen uh, a nutritional report for are, are pretty much a really good food. Um, when, when journalists ask me, 
um, about insects, sometimes I say that if you ask scientists to design the perfect meat, nutritionally speaking, they would probably come up with, uh, with an insect. Um, it's really the, the healthier meat you, you, can, you can probably find. Um, in terms of sustainability, insects are good from many point of views. Um, the, the usage of land, uh, especially the feed when compared to beef, um, um, less emissions, and um, in this um, period with the uh, virus uh, going on, um, I can add that one of the advantages of crickets seems to be that uh, the viruses that attack uh, insects are usually very incompatible with humans. So the transmission of diseases between insects and, and humans, at least at the level of viruses, I understood it, it would be very unlikely, if not close to impossible. And, and this is another good reason for, for developing this uh, new market. Uh, I have another quick video before we, we start the conversation. And, uh, and this was, um, comes from an event we organized in um, Bangkok uh, with the help of the uh, Cordon Bleu Chef School. Uh, it was a, a special menu that the chefs, uh, French and Asian chef, developed uh, to have the people trying recipes where, where you almost don't see the insect and you focus on the taste. It's, it's a one minute video. Uh, maybe Massimo, uh, if it's possible to, uh, we cannot hear you very well, if it's possible to have the volume up. I can try. Okay, okay, very well. Okay. Um, one last remark is regards regulation. I, I've been telling you about the European Union process. Uh, unfortunately, the novel food law in Europe uh, is pretty strict and, and take a long time to approve any food innovation. And this, this series of webinar is about food innovation. So I have to say, I understand how much European Union care about uh, protecting um, the safety uh, of uh, the consumers, but at the same time uh, makes innovation uh, very complicated, not just for insects, but, but for a number of things that uh, have not been eaten for 25 years uh, safely in Europe. This is the basic rule. So if Asian people or uh, North American people have been eaten something uh, for, for years and, and it's proven completely safe, safe uh, the European Union doesn't care. It has European uh, um, people that um, must eat that ingredient um, for at least 25 years before we are sure it's safe. Um, regulatory problems happens actually also in other countries. I would say US, UK, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, uh, what I don't know how to call them, maybe Anglo-Saxon countries, they have a practical approach 
um, to custom clearance and, and food uh, regulations. Um, and they don't seem to have a problem with insects and, and as food, um, as well as other innovation. But um, Asia, um, a number of countries, uh, the food agency is not that fast to, to, to see new trends and, and, and innovation that may really help uh, the food market and business. And in these cases, it may take years before uh, the innovation is, is accepted. And then you can clear a custom, you can be on the shelf, so you, you can be completely legal. Um, so for the insects, this, this, this is taking time and, um, and, um, and uh, even uh, um, changing, changing the, the law uh, or being accepted in, in countries where insects were eaten regularly can be, can be really complicated. For example, in China, silkworm is a legal food, but crickets or other insects um, were never officially approved. So they are eaten, but if you, if you package it and try to sell it in a supermarket and you don't go to the novel food procedure, it technically would be illegal. Um, uh, one last thing about what, what I'm doing now, that the cricket pasta is, is already designed and I'm just waiting for the European Union approval in order to find a food distribution in Europe. Um, I'm working on something um, different uh, with um, uh, some partners from Singapore and with the help of the Singaporean government and the Food Innovation Research Institute in Singapore, uh, we are trying to develop a snack that puts together plant-based uh, protein sources uh, with insect um, powder. Um, and one of the reasons is a lot of people is becoming vegetarian or vegan because um, of the uh, nutritional aspects. They think uh, meat is not healthy. Uh, but at the same time, uh, plant, plant uh, vegetable cannot always pro provide the minerals and the vitamins you need. Um, so for me, the, some plant can be a superfood as, as much as um, uh, insects, but when together, they, they also make a, a very complete nutritional profile, um, which, which uh, I hope is, might be very interesting for consumers that are not vegans, because vegans are a little, uh, it's a no-go with them uh, when it comes to insects. Uh, vegetarians are, are more flexible, and of course, flexitarian is, is the target now for, for healthy foods, food products, like the one we are developing. I think this, this is kind of all for now, because I'm really looking forward to hear what are your questions and what part of insects you are willing to know more. Okay, Massimo, uh, thank you very much. Maybe I, I would like to invite people uh, uh, from the audience uh, to start uh, uh, to ask uh, uh, questions. And uh, from my side, Massimo, I, I am very curious and I would like to, to share also with the others, how did you come up with this idea of uh, starting uh, uh, this innovative business? It was, it was from an Italian. Um, I, I, I just moved to Southeast Asia. And so I was in a kind of a sabbatic year. I was just exploring around. And, and someone from Italy, a friend of friends, asked me to explore uh, edible insects. His angle was um, more uh, uh, nutraceutical than, than um, uh, nutrition. Um, because he's a sport dietitian, so he was trying to find out what um, what you can extract from insects that that can be good for sport or diet. And and this is just the reason why I, I found out that yeah, eating insects is something that happens in a lot of places and it's pretty interesting as a potential business. And when it when it comes to the the choice of pasta. Uh, of course, most of the people think, because I'm Italian, I thought of mixing uh, wheat flour and cricket flour to make pasta. But I'm not, I'm not sure it's because I'm Italian. I just think that uh, dry foods, when you have a powder like, like cricket powder, 
uh, dry foods like crackers, uh, breadstick. Um, they, it's, it's very easy to mix the two things um, and it's easier to convince the people to try it. Uh, it the taste also is a good match. So, um, and the pasta is, is really almost everywhere in the world. So for me it was not, not because of my Italian origin actually. It's, I still think the pasta is a good idea. Um, although also snacks, snacks can be really like chips, uh, chips made with different ingredients like, like um, veggies. Um, now as you can see from the shelves in supermarket, um, the number of snacks is multiplying. And luckily, some of them, they are, they are healthy. I mean, not all the snacks are, are, are fried chips. Okay. And uh, there is another question from Michele. Um, okay. Massimo, thank you for the presentation. And uh, I would like to ask you uh, how challenging is uh, uh, or how challenging was to start uh, this business for you? Because uh, I saw from the slide that uh, it looks like, um, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, breed uh, cricket. Looks like you don't need too much uh, space. And, uh, but how can you um, start it? Or uh, did you locate it into Thailand because it was easier to start this type of business? What, what is your experience about uh, starting this type of business and make uh, the ingredients to create this pasta? Yeah, well, actually, I, for, I forgot to mention this. Personally, I don't do much, meaning that I buy the cricket flour. Uh, I found the OEM, um, a co-packer, uh, to make the pasta. Uh, so the entire process was a process of selecting suppliers, uh, design the package, uh, you know, et cetera, uh, which is what most of the startups uh, are doing. So I, I'm not sure this is a, a, a law that applies to every startup, but, but in most of the cases, when you have a, um, a very low technology uh, process, like making pasta, uh, as a part of what you're doing, you may not want to buy the machinery from the very beginning, uh, but you want to find the co-packer that, that will make the exact product that you are looking for. Uh, so that you run production uh, batches only when you need it. Um, in the case of the insects, by the way, actually I forgot to, to, to say this, but somehow um, there, are, there are different steps. One is the farming, which is, relates to agriculture, and it's like farming chicken. Probably you, you will not be processing the chicken. So the, the frozen chicken you find in the supermarket, there will be a company that processes the chicken but there will, there will be farmers uh, farming the, the, the animal. So somehow it's similar to, in Thailand definitely the, the farmers are usually small farmers uh, and never foreigner because it's, it's technically also legal for the foreigner here to be a farmer. Uh, then you have a dozen of companies uh, that just make the cricket powder um, so they buy the crickets. In a few cases, they have their own farm, but I think they buy the majority of the crickets from the Thai farmers that have been doing that for, for decades. Um, and so you have, you, have, you, have, you have the part of the cricket flower makers, and then you have the startups that design food products and they buy the cricket flower. Um, so I would say it's divided into three, three different uh, businesses. Um, in Europe and US, the model is slightly different because um, from the beginning, the cricket farms have been uh, big ones. Um, so they also contain the processing facility that make the powder usually. It's, it's rarely just a, a cricket farm. So you can imagine the US-Europe model, like factory farming um, on a large scale, a large plant, um, and, and, but usually they will make the, the cricket farming and the cricket flower making together. And then there will be the startup buying the flower from them. While in Thailand, it's even more divided because you have these very small farms that, that may have maybe only 100 square meters of cricket farm. This is a, the situation at the moment. So I, I kind of buy what I need where, where I need for now. Um, I would say it's a, it's a, 
it might be a business, even the farming. Uh, I'm a consultant sometimes for, for new farms, uh, but it's also a risky business uh, because first you have to compete with the small farmers with a very low cost of labor in Thailand. Uh, and second, uh, we are not sure how big this market will be in five or ten years. So I would say someone wants to uh, invest money to make a cricket farm. Uh, it's interesting as a business, but it's it's not a uh, risk risk proof. Eh? Uh, okay, Massimo, thank you for uh, the answer. There is also Peter Bassett that uh, she raised her hands and uh, I think she will. Uh, uh, ask you something. Yeah, hi, Massimo. Um, thank you, thank you. As always, really interesting. Um, look, I just, I, um, I find it really interesting and when you're talking about the insight that people are disgusted by, by insects, but as an ingredient, it works. So I'm interested in how you decided to though call your product cricket pasta because then it really highlights it. Whereas you see other energy bars, for example, EXO, they don't have, they don't have explicitly cricket or the insect in the title. So I wonder what the decision about this was and if you change it. Also, do you, do you change or experiment with the names for different markets? So, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Uh, has been um, subject to a debate, EXO, the, 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 the cricket, uh, energy bar you mentioned, I, I know the founders, and they, they started with cricket uh, pretty small on the label, and they ended up with cricket bigger in the, in the last version of their packaging. And, um, and I, I believe is the same reason uh, why I call my cricket pasta uh, like that, and the cricket, it's, it's really big uh, on the package. Um, the cricket is, is the entire point. I mean, uh, some, some uh, investors in the US told me, oh, why you call your company Bugsolutely? It, it reminds too much of insects. And someone else said, oh, why you call the pasta cricket pasta? I said, well, if I remove the insects, we miss the entire point. Then there is, then there is no point. We have to somehow communicate that this is insect because insects are a superfood. And once the people will get used to, to Will, will get over the distaste, uh, the preconception regarding the distaste. Um, they, they need to, to be reminded that there, is a, there are good reasons for this entire new category. Um, and, and this is the rational part. And then there is a, an emotional side to this, which is um, people are uncomfortable with eating insects because they always thought that insects are something that you find in the garden of your house or maybe they are in the soil, they will be dirty. In some cases, they, they can be poisoning. Um, ants sometimes are poisoning, for example. Um, they are a pest for the agriculture. So they, they, that's like that attached to the insects. There, there are a number of negative things that, but they, they, which, which are making up making us a little emotional regarding eating them. Um, and the reason, and the way to convince people is, is totally to have their trust in this. Because when they feel uncomfortable, they need someone to, to, to make them feel better about trying this experience, and, uh, which can be a purchasing experience or a tasting. Um, which means, for example, in my opinion, it's important that these products find their way to the supermarket shelf. Because most of the startup uh, at the beginning used to sell these these products only online, but online you can sell anything. I can start up, a, I can set up an e-commerce shop in five minutes. This doesn't give you any special credibility with the consumers, but but finding your product in their usual corner shops or in the famous supermarket chains, then of course it, this help you a lot with the purchasing experience. And, and the credibility you need, because a lot of people ask me, is, is it safe to eat insects? And of course it is safe, but their, their, their preconception toward eating insects translates into a lot of uh, fake problems, like, uh, is this safe or, or does this taste good, you know? Um, so I really believe that we shouldn't play with the trust of the consumers. We shouldn't hide that this is insect. We should tell immediately, look, 
So for example, I, I didn't like when someone made some uh, uh, survey in supermarkets giving people uh, insects without to try, without telling them that it was insect. This is terrible. We, we, we shouldn't, you know, be so, uh, how can I say, we should have more understanding for, for the discomfort that the people have. So to me, it's important that this is clear on the label, uh, that all that we sell is certified and tested, because if, if we happen to make a mistake with the food safety at this point, uh, this new small market is, is there from the beginning. And we should also prepare ourselves uh, to the fact that some people might be allergic to insects. Uh, at some point, someone will, maybe just one person in a million, may have an anaphylactic shock uh, because of the allergy. And, and, and this, because of the insect and the media willing to have, uh, you know, uh, big headlines, uh, might be something that we have to deal with in terms of public relations in, at, at some point. Yeah, uh, thank you, Massimo. Uh, I don't know if there are other questions, but I'm very uh, curious about this market. And uh, in your opinion, by considering also the recent topics and, um, uh, I don't know, maybe arguments uh, related to nature and um, uh, environment sustainability. Are insects part of a solution uh, or uh, do you see insects related to only uh, superfood? Um, usually I, I, I consider like, like uh, three reasons to, 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 for insect eating. Um, and they are kind of different one from the other. So the first one is taste. Um, so when we talk about food, uh, taste should be always the, the first thing we talk about because it doesn't taste good. There is no even point in, in trying to sell it. Um, but taste is also something subjective. Um, so the second is the nutritional properties. And, and nutritional properties, they are effect. You go to a lab and you, you get uh, your nutritional facts. Um, so when I communicate to people, uh, the part with the taste, I can tell it tastes good, but they, they will not believe me. I mean, it's, it's just my opinion, right? It's, it's, not, it's not really effective because uh, yumminess is subjective. While the nutritional part, which I stress a lot, uh, that, that's a fact. If you have these minerals, these vitamins, and this protein, you are a superfood no matter what. Um, so I treat these two selling points slightly different, the taste and, and the nutritional problem. Uh, sustainability uh, for me is personally very important and I see it's important when I talk uh, to other businesses or to the media. And up to two or three years ago, um, sustainability seemed to be not a key reason for the majority of the people when they choose what they buy in a supermarket in, in terms of food. Um, people were considered a, a little um, selfish for this. Um, Sustainability by itself is not a big selling point, or at least it was. I have to say that um, in the last two years, because of the signals we get uh, of, an, uh, of a potential um, uh, ecological crisis affecting the entire planet, um, I, I think the perception and the, the importance of sustainability in the consumer's mind is changing and it's become way more than four or three years before. And it, it, it may really become also another uh, key selling point at the mainstream level. Did, did I answer to you, your question? Well, in terms of sustainability, well, crickets are just, uh, insects are just fantastic. Less water, less feed, um, because it's a better conversion rate. Um, faster development, uh, less diseases, um, less land, less emissions of methane gas. It's, it's a very long list. Okay, sure, and uh, it's clear. Uh, and you also replied to my question very well. Uh, I don't know if uh, there is other question, maybe, maybe Giacomo is moving the hand, the hand. no? Uh, Giacomo is a lawyer and is also working from China. Uh, maybe um, Massimo, if you would like to, to tell us more, 
uh, you have a business here in Thailand with absolutely Thailand and another one in China together with Bella Pupa is it correct uh, Bella Pupa um I hate I hate the the expression uh, serial entrepreneur <laughs> but for some reason I end up opening a lot of startups so actually Baxolutri China um I I started it with a Chinese partner three and a half years ago and then one year ago I, I sold it to my Chinese partner I sold my shares to my Chinese partner so I'm I'm totally out of it um, and absolutely China developed the first snack with silicone powder, um, which will be launched or it's, it's been launched, I think, um, um, with a new packaging a few months ago. Uh, but I don't know. How, it's only for the Chinese market. And, um, and I, I don't know how it's going now. So I'm totally out of it. Um, uh, but the, the third startup uh, that I, I, I set up with uh, the Singaporean partners I mentioned before, um, that's, that's something I'm still a part of. And, uh, um, and we set up the company in Singapore for a number of reasons, one of which uh, is that the investors uh, like, um, like Singapore for the legal status uh, and, uh, I mean, to open a startup. It's a, it's a it's an environment that uh, investors really like. Although I have to say that in the last two years, I've seen a um, food accelerator and, and food investment happening in Thailand at a pace that was really unknown uh, uh, five or 10 years ago. Uh, I would say when I came to Thailand seven years ago, there was practically no, no acceleration programs for startups. Uh, and very few venture capital here. Then five years ago, I noticed that uh, um, uh, some institutions and, and funds uh, financing digital, digital application, etc. And in the last two years, finally, I have seen this in food too. Um, so um, now, I would, Bank Solutri Thailand was set up in, 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 in Thailand because here for cricket, um, is still a very good place to be. So if, if you need to buy uh, um, some tons of, of crickets, um, um, this is definitely a good place to be. And now even in terms of uh, investors and environment, for example, I, I helped uh, one company to uh, apply for the Board of Investment status in Thailand recently. And they found out that uh, there are already two other edible insect companies in Thailand that, uh, that got the BOI status. Um, so it's kind of also the Ministry of Agriculture now is aware of this and as a team working on insects. So I, I would say that in the last two or three years, both the in investor environment and also the, the government agencies here are, are pretty interested in, uh, in, the, in the bug uh, potential uh, new market. I say potential new market because at the moment, um, I would say there are probably maybe 200 startups all over the world, uh, but their numbers are still very small. So everyone thinks this will be bigger, but, but it's very hard now to say when, when this will be big. No, it's clear and uh, thank you, uh, Massimo. Uh, one more question from Michele that uh, raised his hand. Okay. Uh, thank you, Giacomo. Um, uh, yes, uh, it's uh, about the consideration uh, because um, about a year ago, I, uh, I brought one uh, box of uh, Baxolutri pasta to Italy uh, to show and uh, in terms of uh, uh, professionals, uh, sport uh, people, uh, semi-professional athletes, they're always looking for um, food supplement or products with high protein. And um, uh, they were very, very much interested, but they understand that Italy or Europe is uh, still behind uh, uh, understanding how to certify this type of product for European market. Uh, but it looks like there is a, a, a not an issue, a, could be like actually a large portion of the market uh, of uh, professional and semi-professional uh, athletes 
that are looking for uh, other type of uh, protein supplement, let's call it. Uh, for your experience, uh, uh, Massimo, how long uh, do you think Europe or Italy will be able to accept this type of product uh, in a normal uh, uh, GDO, normal uh, distribution? Um, I, this, this topic of the reg European regulation, uh, uh, this can be a subject of the webinar that lasts an entire day because it's super complicated and it's been going on for five years. Um, so if someone of you is interested in this, I have a blog post uh, that summarizes most of it and with links to the documents that are necessary to understand the framework, which is, which is really complicated. But so let, let me see if I can, if I can make this uh, quick. Uh, the key problem is the novel food regulation. So insects have not been eaten in Europe safely for 25 years. So they are a novel food. And so they have to go through the novel food procedure. Um, the, the first step, every, everyone, anyone can apply, even individual people. They don't even have to be European citizen. Uh, so let's say you want uh, not crickets, that's already under, under approval. You find a new insect uh, and you want it to be uh, a legal food in, in Europe you have to go through a procedure which will take a couple of years and uh, uh, some thousand dollars of lab tests and documents. You probably need a lawyer to do this. But then once you get the approval for that species of insects or uh, let's say molecule that you extract from something, um, it's a, once it's approved, it's approved for everyone. So um, it, it gets published like a European approved food and the day after, in theory, you are supposed to be able to import that in the European Union. So crickets, in particular, Aceta domesticus, the species that is in English is called house cricket, there have been two or three applications um, submitted um, in 2018. Uh, since they are supposed to be approved in, two, in less than two years, uh, the approval is already late and I expect it very soon. Um, once, let's say, the Aceta domesticus is approved, um, in theory, you, 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 you should be allowed to sell it uh, all over the European Union. Um, when you see products like this, these are um, crickets, uh, uh, from Denmark, from a startup in Denmark. Um, when you see these products in some shops in Europe, it's because some countries in the last years have been very tolerant and very flexible regarding the insects. And the European Union know about this. So if you are a startup in Europe in this moment and you buy cricket that are farmed in Europe and you sell it in Europe, so you don't have to deal with any custom, um, in, you are, you are probably you, have, you probably can be in supermarkets in at least five to seven countries, but not, not in Italy. Italy always been the worst in terms of not being flexible on insects. Um, so in this moment, you may import from outside the European Union only in Denmark, Finland, and UK, if we still consider it Europe. Uh, because in their regulation on edible insects, they, they, they allow also import from outside the European Union. Um, but uh, most of the other countries, um, the food agency um, allows some small business to sell in some supermarkets, but um, they would hardly, like in the case of Belgium, it explicitly says uh, no insects from outside the European Union. So, I'm sorry if this was a little long, but practically uh, in the few countries where the food agencies accept to see insects in, in supermarkets, the sales seems to be good. Um, but in general, un until the, the European Union will approve the crickets and we can export crickets from Thailand, for example, where they cost four times less, um, the, the European market for these products will be always niches and some initiatives here and there, but will be unofficial. Um, I don't know if this answer to your question. I have to add that there is also a, um, a list of countries that will be authorized to export insects to the EU. And this list is based on uh, the European Union demanding all the countries some documents about how insects are farmed. 
And right now, uh, Canada, South Korea, and, and another one, uh, they sent the documentation very early and they are already in the list. Thailand, the Ministry of Agriculture was pretty slow. Uh, so Thailand is still on, not on the list. But they, they, they told me the document has been sent by Thailand. So by July or August, Thailand should be in that list too. Uh, thank you, Massimo. It's very, very interesting. So probably we just need to be patient a bit. Yeah, with, with Europe, that's the case. Uh, and, and you know, if, if we cannot completely legal, legally sell this in supermarket or clear the custom, it's, it's also very hard to understand if this market is going to be big or not because we just, uh, we, we don't really have a, a, a real situation where we test this. It's a different case with the US. US, uh, the FDA has always been okay with insects. So in, in the US, there has never been really a, a legal problem. Uh, and, and, and for me, there it's more a lack of interest from the distribution um, and uh, too much focus on energy bars. And most of the startups in the US decided to go for the energy bars uh, for the reason you said, that there is this debate are insects gonna be a functional food for fitness, for example, or can be a mainstream food? So in the US, the idea has been mostly that this, is, this has to go first through the fitness, and that's why they did it so many energy bars. But my doubt is, um, is it, is it a, is insects, because they have 65% protein content when dry, is it, is it really competitive as a, only as a protein source? Because whey powder, the, the one that is the cheapest for fitness, is really cheap. So can, can really crickets compete with, with protein sources that on a, when you just look at the protein, you don't even look at the amino acid profile. You don't care the quality of the protein. You just want a lot of protein. Um, maybe insects are not, are not that competitive if we focus only on that. I'm not sure we, we, we would need to ask a nutritionist. Clear and thanks. Maybe one more question and then I don't know if there are others or uh, uh, we can close it. But uh, there is one question from MJ. He's asking uh, uh, which are interesting international markets that you see have great potential for bugs? Yeah, yeah, but also a very good question. Um, actually, People think that because I, I'm in Thailand, I make the cricket pasta for Thai people, and, and that's really wrong. I don't even try to sell cricket pasta to Thai people. The fact is, places where insects have been eaten traditionally as street food are usually the areas where the people don't understand the, the new packaged uh, products like this that, that comes at a premium price, um, you know, because let's say, Insects in Thailand have been eaten traditionally in the countryside um, for their taste. People don't even know they are a superfood and they don't know they are sustainable. So the reason for buying crickets in Thailand for people that traditionally eat cricket is, is completely different from the reason to buy cricket pasta or cricket crackers. Um, so they, they wouldn't even understand why they have to pay a premium price for this. So, um, for me, the, the markets that are where insects uh, in, in, as an ingredient for packaged food uh, might become successful are, are places where they have purchasing powder. So in Asia, let's say Japan, South Korea, New Zealand, Australia, uh, where there is a um, where the people is really cares. There is a trend to healthy nutrition. Um, there is a there is a trend uh, toward uh, protein-rich foods. Um, um, there, is, there is people care about the sustainability. So for me, clearly, Western countries, um, with some exception. Um, but even in China, where, where they eat, a, in many regions, they eat a lot of insects. Um, I don't think they, they, I think it will take time before they, they understand um, a chips or meatballs or, or, or packaged food processed, highly processed packaged food with insects. 
OK, uh, clear, Massimo. I, I don't know if there are any other questions or uh, otherwise I will, uh, I will go. OK, there is one more for um, uh, Giacomo, please. Uh, uh, OK, hi, Massimo. Thank you very much for your presentation. I think it's uh, super interesting. Please uh, forgive me if my question might be might sound a bit off topic, but um, I was thinking, do you think there's potential for uh, other applications not strictly related to food? So I was thinking about uh, skin cares, uh, body oils, you know, like oil extract from crickets or other insects which could have uh, a broad market for uh, uh, you know, for consumers, not only in Thailand, all around the world? Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, I think, uh, I don't know much about it because also I don't think much has been tried. So let's say when, when you get a new thing like, like crickets, um, the, the, what we have done until now is the simplest possible processing, just make them dry and grind them into powder. Um, in a few cases, um, and this usually is, is, is done with uh, mealworms and silkworms, the fat is, is um, separated. And that's also not, not, not high technology, it's pretty, it's pretty simple process. There are four or five ways to do that. Um, in China, for example, they, they take a lot of uh, oil from the silkworm that they farm for the silk, um, and I didn't know this before, and, and this is because it's usually a super oil. Uh, crickets have uh, maybe 7-10% fat content, so it's, it's not an insect that contains a lot of oil. But worms, mealworms, silkworms, bamboo worms, they have a lot of oil. 20-30% uh, of their content is oil. And it's a, it's a super good oil. I mean, the, the profile of the oil, I'm not an expert, but they say it's, it's really healthy. Um, I tasted black soldier fly. I didn't speak about it because it's, it's a larva that is becoming, um, um, they, they think it might be really the future for animal feed. So people don't want to buy larva of a fly. Maybe, we are not sure about that. Uh, but for, for as an animal feed and as a source of oil, it's considered uh, fantastic. So personally, I, I tasted um, the butter from the extracted, from the dry powder of the larva of this fly, the taste is also very good. Um, so that's another step. Um, something that has not been done is uh, solubility. Now to achieve solubility, I think the process is called hydrolyzation, uh, takes machinery that costs a fortune. So it's this you, you need, as a startup, you, you cannot get there because you need machinery that costs a fortune. So solubility, I think has been tried with cricket powder only, only by one startup in Canada. Um, so at the moment, for example, you cannot do drink with cricket powder because it's, it's not soluble. That would require investment for, for the machinery and, and, and finding out that there is a market for a soluble um, uh, cricket protein. And, and going on from that, you are right, there, there might be um, minerals or, or vitamins or other aspects that we we can extract um, and there might be a market for it so let's say it, kind of everything is new is new in the farming is new in the processing and is new in the product that you can think of i think maybe with algae seaweed and and other new ingredients that we are rediscovering uh, is the same you know we, we forget that there was an opportunity and now that we find it, uh, if it's big companies around it, they will probably invest a lot in R&D and, 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 and testing these things. But at the moment, edible insects uh, that I know of, it's only small companies, only startups, uh, with a limited capability of, of investing in, in R&D. Mm. I see. So, uh, uh, and uh, getting back to what you said about the solubility, uh, you know, when you were talking about the properties of the product, I was thinking this would be perfect for, uh, you know, one of these uh, milkshakes that you do before you hit the gym, right? So, yes. uh, 
so why i mean uh, why uh, big giants like herbalife and so on they're not looking into this i mean they have the resources to uh, uh you know uh invest in this uh, solubility uh, process and so on how come they're not doing it is it because you think and even probably they don't even need to market it as uh, cricket powder they just can say you know it's like a pure proteins and that's it i mean they wouldn't even have that issue if they don't want to disclose it i mean yes. yeah I, b I believe for for most of the big companies this insects are, are still a very small business uh so they think maybe it's just early because the quantities Let's say you invest you, you invest one hundred million dollars to make a factory to make a package of food with insects. Do you, do you really have um, uh, consumers for that from the very beginning? I'm not sure of that. Mm. So I believe I believe not being not knowing how many years this will take before it gets mainstream is one of the reasons why they're not doing it. Um, this doesn't necessarily, it's not, doesn't, I mean, the fact that when we look at insects, we find the idea so, so good from many aspects, uh, doesn't mean that the money we follow. For example, I, I'm not a fan uh, of insects as feed for animals, um, because you take five kilos of, let's say, crickets, the perfect meat, nutritionally, in terms of sustainability, you know, that, that's the meat that you really want, and you give these five kilos to a pork, uh, to a pig, uh, so that you get, you get in exchange one kilo of nutritionally much poorer meat in exchange. Mm. So I find this a lot less romantic than, than eating insects directly. But if you look at the money now uh, from investors, they are, they are all going to insects, uh, to farming insects as feed. So the EXO, the energy bar startup we were talking before, uh, got uh, $100,000, I think, at the first round, seed, um, um, $1.2 million at the second round, and, and the Series A funding round, they got $4 million. This three years ago. Uh, this is the biggest investment that we know of with a startup in insects. And okay, it's not, it's not little, for five, five million dollars is, is okay for a seed startup. Um, but the three startups that are farming black soldier fly, um, one is in South Africa and the other two are in Europe, uh, as feed for aquaculture, uh, last year they all got at least 100 million dollars in the last round, mm. round of financing. So you see the difference. It's like, it's like the, the investor have seen a big business immediately with, with the insects for feed, and they still don't think the same as, as uh, insects for food. Um, so what can I say? Yeah, there, there is definitely, um, they, they, the big companies definitely still have some doubts about it. Uh, might be just because they say it's better to wait uh, four or five years so that the regulation is settled and, and the idea is more and more into the idea into the mind of the consumer. Uh, I, was, I was looking before for the uh, cricket shot because you mentioned the drink. This is from a startup in Denmark um, um, and it's, it contains also spirulina um, but the, the powder is, is a thin powder, so it's ground, ground of thin, but, but still it's not soluble. So mm. if you wait, you will see the powder at the end here. So I'm, I'm, I mean, I like all these new products, but, but some, I'm not sure they can work in the way they are now. So solubility, yeah, you're right. For fitness, it would definitely help because especially the first cricket powder that was produced here uh, was also very thick. Now they, they invested more in the grinder and they know better how to do it. So now when you buy cricket flour, it's definitely thinner, but this doesn't mean that it's soluble. That, that would require um, an investment in machinery. We're talking about maybe some million dollars. Uh, so you, you, need a, you need to really believe that there is a big market uh, that will buy a soluble cricket flour, which I'm not sure of. Okay, thank you.
Um, before we, we wrap up, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it before. Uh, I hope my uh, email address was um, was in the last slide of my presentation, or maybe I can shut it here so that if you have other doubts, feel free to shoot me a message even in the next few days. I'm, I'm always happy to, to share um, what I know about this because I really find it nice. Uh, it's, it's because of the sustainability and the healthy side of it. Um, most of the people in this new market uh, are happy to be evangelists and, 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 and share mm. what they know. You know it's, it's, it's also where we should all start from. Uh, Massimo, uh, there are two and a half questions from, uh, from the other people that uh, meanwhile are chatting on the group chat. Uh, so there is one more question from MJ and uh, the second one from Giacomo, the person that was speaking before. Uh, so, uh, regarding MJ in question, he's asking uh, uh, to processing uh, how are inset kill and uh, are there any ethical issues uh, like farm animal face regularly? Uh, can you answer to this question? Yeah, of course. Um, um, I've been asked that a lot. How do we kill crickets? Actually, it's, it's, it's one of the most common questions with the media. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm smiling because um, um, clearly this, this question uh, makes sense because the consumer are emotional, emotional about the way we treat animals. And they think a cricket is an animal, so maybe it feels pain. But according to most of the, the research uh, that I could find online, I'm talking about the academic paper, uh, insects don't feel uh, um, really pain the way we the way we consider pain, um, and they are not self-aware. And I have to give you a couple of examples. Um, one of the experiments is simply to, to cut half of the body of a cricket or a grasshopper, and the part with the head was keep on doing the usual stuff, eating, trying to go around, like like the other part of the body was still attached to it. Uh, there are similar experiments that somehow prove that, that the animal doesn't have really a, a nervous system, um, pain reaction, or self-awareness the way um, uh, a swine can have. A chicken maybe are not the perfect example because they are, they are not that smart as an animal. But let's say uh, most of the large animals uh, and, and insects are not comparable. I would say uh, I'm not a scientist, but I would say we can consider insects uh, closer to plants when it comes to pain. Uh, so we shouldn't be that worried uh, about their, their, um, the way we kill them. Um, but having said this, um, in Thailand, the, the, the traditional way um, to harvest the cricket is just to put them in a plastic bag and, and to close the plastic bag and forget the, the crickets are there. They will suffocate. Um, now, unfortunately, this, uh, if I tell this to the media and, and some consumers, that they will feel, how can I say, uh, sympathetic with crickets. <laughs> um, while the European and US way to harvest them is usually to, to put them in a bag, but then put the bag in a, in a fridge. And with low temperature, they will start sleeping before they die. So it's considered to be, you know, a, a very marketing-wise, uh, a very nice way to tell people how we kill them, you know, this, the, the, freezing, the freezing process. Um, but actually, since I really believe they, they don't feel anything, I don't, I don't see a huge difference with, between one method and another one. Clear. Actually, I find this as a, as a way to reduce global animal suffering because uh, uh, all the other meat that we eat, uh, that comes from animals that usually suffer a lot. Hmm. No, no, it's clear and thank you for answering. I think that uh, you, you say a lot. Uh, maybe Giacomo, uh, you have another question and then I continue with the last two and then I think we can conclude this seminar. 
uh, online. Please, Jagum. Yes, yes I, I was just thinking about another niche, which is, uh, do you think there's a potential to develop products like uh, uh, Beyond Meat, Impossible Foods, you know, this kind of like plant-based uh, burgers and, uh, you know, plant-based uh, meat uh, starting from crickets or other insects? Thank you. Yeah, actually, the, the burgers, uh, there is a startup in Germany making burgers with insects. Um, another one is Sento in Switzerland, the one that is selling in Coop. Uh, they make meatballs and I think also burgers. Um, so I would say in Europe there are at least uh, three or four doing some stuff like that. How they do that, I'm not sure of. Meaning that um, I, um, I didn't check if they put piece of crickets, piece of mealworms or crickets, or they use the powder or they extract. I, I don't know what part of the insects goes into that. Um, but apparently they are selling in the, small, the few places where the, the retail where, where they are. Um, it seems they are selling, they are selling uh, pretty well. So in, in Europe, in general, the startups, um, um, I, I don't think they are going super fast, but most of them, they are reporting quite good experiences. They have a problem because the mainstream distribution still still is not picking up with, with these new products um so uh, so your question was about uh burgers ah yeah um yeah uh, there, there are so some cases um i think yeah it can go in that direction definitely um um by the way beyond uh, uh an impossible um I, I, I like the kind of innovation they are doing, but uh, it's, it's also generating some confusion because um, they use a lot of ingredients. Uh, there is a lot of processing. Um, it's not clear how healthy it is in terms of, of uh, ingredients. I mean, I like them, eh? and I like the idea not to kill um, big animals um, like cattle. Uh, but at the same time, um, this, these products might be subject to a lot of criticism uh, because can they really position themselves as healthy products? Um, uh, are they sustainable? Because okay, uh, uh, beef is not sustainable, but if you, if you need a lot of ingredients and a lot of processing, you need also a lot of energy uh, to make it. Mm. Um, so I, I, I really don't know this. I'm just uh, throwing the first ideas I got when I saw this uh, meat substitute and, and compare them with what I'm doing. I think it's kind of a different playground. I mean, it comes from the same area, trying to find the sustainable ways, try to reduce uh, big animal meat consumption, but it's a different, definitely a different way to do it. So yeah, I think, I think insects can be used for, for that kind of food too. Uh, when it comes to liquid or squeamish, like a yogurt, I always get a little scared about the reaction with people because this taste and this gas is often connected to squeamish things, creamy things, not dry things. Uh, so maybe it might be harder to introduce on the market something that is partially liquid and contain insects. But this is, this is just a feeling that I have, and, and maybe I'm wrong, and, and, and people wouldn't really mind and make a difference between a pasta or a burger with crickets. We, we don't have this kind of market survey. There is almost nothing around. So every idea actually uh, is, has not been tested and could be good. Okay, Massimo, it's very interesting. Uh, there is one comment from uh, Narat that uh, he is working, he's the co-founder of uh, Shabbal. Uh, he's making chocolate. And he say that uh, mixing the insect with uh, cacao butter for making chocolate bar would be great. Maybe yeah. uh, you can keep in contact with him and try to experiment new things. I think that... Uh... Yeah, it's been done. Usually with the whole insect, uh, it's been done. Because the taste, the taste of the insects is usually nutty and, and nuts and chocolate is, is a great match. We know that. So definitely, uh, I think that's, that's a very good uh, uh, possibility.
And Arat, did you ever try? Because I know that also you are from Chiang Mai, so you should be very close and familiar with those uh, farming of uh, something that uh, uh, you would like to, to try, experiment. Uh, what is your opinion? Yeah, it's actually I I interested in in any insect um, personally. I I everything actually, <laughs> and I interesting in. Uh, cricket for a while. I, I saw from like Halloween chocolate bars, uh, many many makers like mix uh, the cricket powder for chocolate bars as well. Of Thai. So I can buy some powder from you. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, we, we as a side business, we also trade uh, uh, cricket flour because we know all the producers um, in Thailand as well as in other countries. Um, so sometimes we we help companies to find a, to find a cricket flower, which is right now still a very unofficial market. Some companies don't even have a website, and with prices that are goes from zero to ten, because with new market is wild west and, and still there are no standards. So yeah, definitely you can contact me for whoever. Um, some some contacts or uh, an idea of the prices and what you should look when you buy a cricket flower. By adding my personal thing, uh, I think uh, there are also possibility to make maybe pizza base uh, or uh, some ingredients for ice cream gelato. Ice cream has been done in the UK. Uh, I don't know if was just for one event uh, or, or they've been going on for a while but I definitely I remember some media articles about uh, nice cream with crickets uh, in UK um, and uh, and uh, yeah uh, definitely everything that where you you use uh, wheat flour or rice flour I think it can be easily done like pizza bread pasta crackers I think all these things you can easily add a percentage of cricket powder and, and improve the nutritional properties. Uh, I would say in the majority of the case, maybe 100% cricket powder would be too much, not just because of the cost. It's, it's still expensive because it, it's still not scaled up and it's still an artisanal production. So one of the limit and the reason why the adoption of insect is still slow, it, it's also that it's, it's so new that that takes uh, still too much energies and time to, to produce it and the price is still a little high. Um, but also because if you use 100% cricket, um, the, the taste might be a little strong and there would be not really reason for that since you just add the 20, 30, 40% of it and you get both the taste and the nutritional properties in, in, in a decent quantity. Um, so I, I see this, the insects like, like always more like an ingredient than, than like a, a, a food by itself, uh, which is what we do with, with most of the other things we eat, which we tend to mix them into recipes. So in the case of industrial food, the, uh, the factory will do that. So I, I see this more like something that will be added to foods than to a, a food by itself. Okay, Massimo. Uh, to recap, we have two more questions. One has been uh, written by Kun Panachakon, and uh, she's saying, as it is mentioned, that any sort of cricket still need in uh, R&D in Thailand. Uh, so it is a challenge for uh, doing weather farming or process activity. Do you have any suggestion for uh, SMEs investor in Thailand? Um, yes, I'm thinking. Well, um, there is there are there are a couple of companies here in Thailand that are trying to package the um, insect uh, and sell in Seven Eleven or convenience store. Um, so probably the, the most famous one is Haiso. Uh, they also spend some marketing in, um, in, um, in some budget in marketing communication um, and they they focus mostly on on whole insects uh, started with crickets silkworm now they have bamboo worms um, 
and they pay the listing fees um, to be in, on the shelves of, of convenience stores. As, as you, most of you know, uh, it's not for free usually. I mean, if, if you are not Coca-Cola or Barilla, um, um, the supermarket will ask you for money to, to, to be on the shelves. So they, they are one of the few cases that also have a budget for that. Um, but I don't know how, how the sales go. So I wouldn't know if, if how, what are the chances of, uh, of a Thai company that make a food product with insects and want to sell to Thai uh, consumers. That would be something, uh, um, so it would be a kind of investment that I would really not know um, if it's worthwhile uh, because I don't have I don't have enough information and I know Thai consumers are little but not enough for that. Um, at the farming level, um, yeah, there there is a there, there might be uh, business opportunities. Um, uh, for example, um, in terms of farming, uh, it's true that many farmers here are farming crickets in the backyard, but they, they usually don't invest any time or money in improving the process. So mostly they use uh, chicken feed for, as a feed for the crickets because it's widely available, uh, but we don't know if it's the best feed available for crickets. Uh, usually they harvest the cricket after I think five weeks. Um, usually they they have different ways to reduce the number of crickets that will die during the process because there is there is a mortality rate. Um, practically, all, most of, of, of what um, can be optimized in, in the, the, the farming level uh, is still not analyzed and, and improved. So I would say probably one of the things I would consider, since the consumption in Thailand is said to be 5,000 tons of crickets per year, uh, eaten by Thai people, so it's not very big in the food market, but it's something. Maybe I would start from uh, seeing uh, how how the farmers can improve uh, uh, the, the farming part and and stay competitive uh, with Europe and US when European and US large factory farms um, will be established um, because uh, that's clearly a business opportunity for Thailand for, for the Thai farmers. Um, be remaining competitive and, and one day maybe exporting crickets to, to Western countries. The Ministry of Agriculture in Thailand, uh, actually for sure, I know um, they, they hope there will be a chance to export crickets in decent quantities. Uh, thank you, Massimo. Uh, there is one more question from Kun Mante. Uh, please. Yep. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Massimo, I was wondering, uh, you mentioned you were um, sourcing the, the materials, the, the, like the crickets and cricket flour from uh, Thailand companies. Uh, I was wondering, is it like, are you working with all, all the time with one uh, supplier or you are changing them from time to time? And then how you are um, assuring the, the quality? Because as I imagine, as a, as a, um, uh, you as a product prefer to have uh, crickets with the same nutrition values all the time. So, wh how, like, what, what, what practices you use to assure this qu uh, quality, uh, the same quality, or perhaps those farmers do some actions uh, to prove it for you. Mm, so can you just comment on that? I'm, I'm curious to know yeah, how does it yeah, work. Sure. Yeah, I, I buy from different suppliers for the reason that maybe next year there will be a supplier that has a better quality or a better price or both. Because they, are all, they started all five, seven years ago. I mean, I'm talking about um, the flower processor. Actually, cricket farming has been the same in Thailand for decades. Uh, but the, the new company I buy the cricket flour from, they started a few years ago because there is no market in Thailand for the cricket flour. That's clearly for export to Europe, US, or, or countries where, where they make a product like cricket pasta is an exception. It's made in Thailand 
And the energy bars, a bar that uh, is made in Chiang Mai, and I mentioned it before, is another one, but these are really exceptional. Otherwise, the cricket flower is definitely for, for export. Um, in terms of uh, certification, um, the Ministry of Agriculture of Thailand, two years ago, three years ago, it was end of seven, 2017, was the first institution in the world to, re to release uh, the guidelines for safety cricket farming. Um, this, this manual, um, um, when followed, um, entitles the farmer also to, to get a certification from the livestock department uh, of the province where, where they are, uh, which is a proper certificate of, of uh, safe um, respect of the safety procedure in the farming part. It's called GAP, Good Agricultural Practice. Um, then the flower, the flower are actually uh, the flower processor are the companies that have to invest more in certification and product consistency. So I would say when the crickets arrive to the flower facility, uh, it becomes a, a, an industrial process. So um, the basic certification is called GMP, but I would say that the one that most of is most common one is HACCP, um, and above HACCP is, is the famous uh, ISO certification. Um, almost no one has, still has an ISO certification because it may cost more than 100,000 baht, uh, and then you have to renew it every, I think, two years. So most here they have the HACCP certification, which I would say is enough. Um, and then they spend some money in lab tests, which includes periodically uh, bacteriological tests, um, sometimes nutritional tests, which are more expensive, and maybe once in a while also checking the heavy metals and the pesticides. Uh, but I would say you really don't find much pesticides or, or heavy metals in Thai cricket, because most of the farmers uh, found the crickets in the backyard, so I'm, I'm, I'm just saying a few meters from their house. So uh, if there are pesticides in the crickets, probably they have a lot of pesticides inside the house too. Um, so I've never seen, I've never seen um, a bad lab test uh, on these things in Thailand. They are, they are done mostly for marketing purposes because the potential buyers, they, they, they want to see definitely uh, nutritional and bacteriological tests, and they are happy if you also have heavy metals and pesticide tests. Uh, in terms of consistency, um, I would say most of the, the, the companies make the powder by roasting the crickets. Roasting means hot hair uh, oven, which is the cheapest oven you can buy, and you can use to dry a, num a number of things, not just crickets. So if you start small, uh, roasting is, is the process to go with because it's cheap, but also because the roasting process works very well with the taste of, of the crickets. The, the nutty taste um, works well with the roasting process. But actually, there are different processes for, for, for drying crickets which would lead to um, kind of a different powder and maybe also a different taste. But this is, this is the future. For now, most of the cricket flour is, is made through roasting. Um, hot hair is expensive in terms of energy, time consuming, uh, but it's also very simple. So everyone, even small companies, can afford the, the machinery and it's scalable. So there are a number of reasons to do that. Once, once you have a decent uh, roasting process and a, and a decent grinder, I would say that then since 100% of the cricket is, is, is ground and roasted and, and it's a very simple process, is usually most of the flower has similar characteristics. I, I, I wouldn't have a problem with that. So once I have the certificate and, and I check the lab test, um, 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 usually I don't have any surprise with, with the consistency in the powder. Um, yeah, 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 I would be pretty, I, I, I would say it would be very intense, as you said also about nutrition. Um, in general, all the nutritional tests I, I, I see uh, the, have the protein level content uh, between 63% and 67%. Um, 
I don't think I think you can play with that with the protein content a little depending on the feed that you give to the crickets or maybe some other conditions, but I think you can have very small changes. I, I don't think you can completely um, uh, to have, I don't think you can have very different nutritional profiles uh, between one cricket powder made in Thailand and another one. But, but this is my guess. I'm not sure 100% about this. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, so before we uh, say goodbye to everyone, I would like to, to thank you all the participants and Massimo for having uh, uh, participated to this uh, webinar, you, the first episode. I think it was uh, very interesting uh, and uh, Massimo, uh, you are a super expert. Uh, we really enjoy this webinar and uh, we would like to invite also every one of you and uh, also your friends uh, to, to the next uh, episode for uh, the upcoming Friday. Thank you.